thank you, Peter, and thank you all in general for coming, and thanks for hosting this. Uh, it's actually an honor to be here for many reasons. One of them is uh, just the general um, expertise we have looking around the audience of people who have worked on Afghanistan, worked in Afghanistan, uh, are uh, from the regions, from Afghanistan, from Pakistan, from India, uh, the, the uh, just general knowledge level um, is uh, quite substantial. So um, uh, it really is an honor. Um, and, and I, I mean, I'd, I'd like to make this a dialogue. So what I'll do is speak for a little bit, and then we'll open this up to questions uh, and answers and make this really a substantive um, dialogue rather than uh, uh, me speaking to you. What I want to do briefly is um, outline... Um, based on the work that I did uh, looking through some of the uh, U.S. intelligence, uh, KGB, um, uh, Politburo archives, uh, and then up through a range of interviews and documents up to today, just lay out for you some of the trends, at least as I see them over the past several decades in Afghanistan, talk a little bit about some issues um, today in the country, and then open it up to questions and answers. Uh, now. First, I wanted to begin by um, a uh, uh, story that I've heard several times uh, from friends in Afghanistan about the American. You, you, you may have heard this one. There's, there's an American who, um, who uh, is walking actually somewhere around the city center now in Kabul, and uh, an Afghan comes up to him and says, you're obviously a Westerner. Um, maybe you're an American. Uh, how long have you been here for? And, and the man says, well, I, I, um, I'm actually writing a book on Afghanistan. And so the Afghan says, well, that's great. Um, you must have been here for a long time doing, doing research, um, uh, talking to a, a range of Afghans, traveling around, around the country. He says, actually, I, I, I just got here yesterday. So uh, the Afghan says, uh, uh, okay, well, you just got here yesterday. You'll, you'll be here for a, a long period of time. You're going to travel up into uh, uh, Mazar Sharif. You'll go to, down to Kandahar. You'll travel uh, out to Herat. Um, you'll, you'll spend several months researching your book. He says, actually, I'm leaving tomorrow. And so um, uh, the Afghan looks a little puzzled and says, well, w w what is your book about? And he says, well, it's Afghanistan, yesterday, today, and tomorrow. <laughs> The, the, the point, though, I think that has come clear, the more times I've heard this, is, uh, you know, in general, the uh, reputation even of the Americans, the staying power in Afghanistan has come under some scrutiny uh, for, you know, the involvement in the 1980s, um, uh, helping back the Mujahideen and then pulling out um, in the early 1990s, the end of the 80s and the early 90s. So uh, that that's sort of, um, you know, one indication I get from talking to people this question about uh, the U.S. has now entered back into Afghanistan. What's its staying power? Not just what is it doing, but what is its staying power? What I want to do, though, is begin by talking very briefly about the history. I mean, one of the things I do try and do is look through a lot of the uh, uh, now declassified intelligence um, on views of Afghanistan and what contributed to um, the rise of instability in the 70s all the way through the 80s and 90s. And there are a couple of things that I would, I would um, note because I think they have direct relevance to what is going on today. And that is, you know, if you look at the past several decades in, in Europe or even the United States, you see a very strong central state. Um, you've even seen, um, uh, you, you know, socialism or, or various parts of socialism. Um, including health health care that has become very centralized in a range of states. My wife is from Canada. The health care system there is very centralized. Well, the, the history of Afghanistan is much more um, localized. Um, if you look in parts of the south, you have a range of local institutions, tribes, sub-tribes, clans, qualms, and other local institutions that have been quite important in a whole range of governance. So I would say the, 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 the whole concept of the state is different uh, than what you may see in many Western countries. And that has very important implications when you get into how to end an insurgency, uh, what, what that state looks like, what is achievable, what do people want in rural areas. Um, uh, and we often come in, in my personal view, with very Western notions of, um, of the entire concept of the state. Uh, that, that I think is, uh, is important. The second issue that, that became very clear uh, is really the role of outsiders. And a lot of the intelligence assessments were 
quite clear about it. I'll just read a very brief segment from a few of them. Um, these are from U.S. Uh, CIA and Defense Intelligence Agency assessments uh, from the uh, uh, early 1990s, even about the role of neighbors. Because the point is, is um, all of Afghanistan's neighbors and other major powers in the region have played uh, helpful or harmful roles in the country. Indians, Pakistanis, Iranians, uh, Russian Soviets, uh, and a range of others. So even as you go through a lot of the archival work, you know, this, this really comes, comes out loud and clear. So, for example, we have uh, reports in the early 1990s, uh, including national intelligence estimates from the U.S., detailing Jamiat was receiving large amounts of cash and military supplies, mostly from Iranian government sources. This is all quoting. Funds and supplies reportedly come from Iran to points in Tajikistan, where they're picked up by helicopters and ferried to the Panjshir and other points. We get this from a range of other um, uh, countries. Um, uh, you get this on the Indians, for example. Uh, India has been uh, uh, New Delhi's primary foreign policy objective in Afghanistan is to counter Pakistan, uh, the, and, and there are details on logistical supplies. The, the point is, though, as we've seen historically, the country has been, um, if, if you think back to one of the more famous books written about, um, about uh, Poland uh, uh, that's called God's Playground, um, it, that there has been a sense that uh, uh, major neighbors have played a fundamental role in uh, Afghanistan, for better or for worse, but to pursue their own national security objectives. And I think understanding today um, uh, Afghanistan and, uh, and understanding the insurgency and understanding governance means understanding that neighbors have, are, and will continue to pursue their own strategic interests in that country. So stabilizing it means fundamentally understanding that uh, practice and that behavior. The book really focuses on what caused the insurgency, at least after the U.S. and Afghan overthrow of the Taliban regime. Um, let me first, at least, in, give you my view of what, uh, of what that insurgency uh, looks like today briefly and, and has looked over the last few years, because the media reporting continues to call this a Taliban insurgency, uh, and, and in my personal view, that is a gross over oversimplification of what actually exists on the ground, where you actually have, in, in fact, a, a range of different networks involved in, uh, um, in, in fighting. So you have, first, you have clearly a range of insurgent groups, from uh, Gulban and Hekmatyar's uh, Hezb uh, to the Haqqani network, to Mullah Omar's Taliban. You also obviously have a range of uh, Uzbek, uh, now Tajik militant groups. You have uh, Al-Qaeda in, in uh, various forms, mostly based from, from Pakistan. Um, and then you have a range of other smaller groups. There have been elements of Lashkari Taiba uh, that have been in Afghanistan. And I could go on on groups, but the point is pretty clear. You, you do not have, this is not only a Taliban insurgency, there are a range of other groups, some of whom have fought each other historically. Hekmatyar and, uh, and, uh, and the Taliban uh, fought uh, in the early, through the mid-1990s uh, against each other. Um, so again, uh, differences somewhat in scope of some of these groups, but I think an appreciation for um, a more diffused and, and often decentralized insurgency than, than is, uh, is, is, is generally understood, at least by the public more broadly. Um, but, but what then led to, and, 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 and of course, as the Obama administration has, has begun to do over the last several months, you know, this is, this is in many ways a regional insurgency, at the very least understanding that uh, every major group that I have just described uh, has uh, presence on both the Pakistani and the Afghan sides of the border. Um, and in many cases, including um, the, uh, Mullah Omar's Taliban really has its command and control node in Baluchistan with Haqqani. It's mostly in North Waziristan. You could, you could, uh, I mean, that with, with Al Qaeda, it's also in Pakistan and places like North and South Waziristan, Bajor. So again, this appreciation for um, the, the the fact that this is a, I think, a much more decentralized insurgency than most people realize, but also a. Um, uh, 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 this is really a regional in scope. Um, and, and so I would say then getting to this question of what caused this insurgency, because I think as we look at ways to move forward, we've got to appreciate what caused 
um, the insurgency in general, uh, this is after the, uh, the, the U.S. and Afghan overthrow of the Taliban regime.